good morning, everybody. And um, I have to say, I'm delighted to be here uh, supporting uh, IMRS. Um, I have to say, I'm in a slightly different position to to normally how I uh, normally because obviously as a the head of a trade body for maritime engineering uh, companies, uh, I'm more suited to chairing the bodies and groups such as this rather than actually having to do a presentation. But uh, Ralph Rayner was rather persuasive, and so, um, and I also note, looking around the room, there's some very knowledgeable people here uh, regarding um, regarding the topic on which I'm about to uh, to speak. I think I, I thought because I'm. Coffee's not that far away, and I realise I'm keeping you from it, that mid-morning caffeine break. But can I perhaps, just out of interest, ask a simple question. Who can see the use of autonomous ships and boats? And I include here, when looking at autonomous ships, anything could be a, uh, point A to B, it could be coastal, it could be ocean-going, say by the end of the next decade. Who thinks that we're actually going to be operating these as a regular basis? That's quite uh, encouraging. So we'll see where we go. Right. Okay. Now you might wonder, I've probably lost the plot here, but there's a reason why I thought I'd look at some of the technologies that are moving very quickly, how technology is advancing and how it's moving through. And therefore, obviously, that's going to have a lot of relevance uh, to uh, you know, the way that autonomy in shipping is going to be adopted. Now, the reason I've included a, a photograph of my car is that this car is equipped with something called adaptive cruise control. Now, believe it or not, this was actually introduced in 2004. So we're talking about quite a long time. Now, what adaptive cruise control is, and anyone who has had a journey on the M1 will know, we have 20 mile stretches of uh, roadworks, is that you can set the cruise control effectively, the distance you want to be from the car uh, in front, and the car will modulate its speed automatically without you having to switch the cruise control on and off all the time. And I can tell you it's brilliant as somebody who has to travel up the M1 uh, quite frequently. So anyway, this technology apparently, according to the Financial Times, was in 2004, was the first to be installed on a, a car by a major manufacturer. And of course, since then, uh, we've, we've got cars now that can park themselves, that have got all sorts of sensors on them uh, for uh, avoidance of collisions, etc. And it's hardly surprising that, um, you know, in the years in between, we now have in the automotive sector um, the, uh, you know, uh, the attempts at creating, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles or driverless cars, although uh, the regulations are not quite here to. Uh, uh, to advance those, and I'll be talking about regulation in a moment because obviously that is very important as far as the sector is concerned. So, how about looking at te other technologies? Well, the phone in our pocket is probably a very good example, and when you look at the advance of phones from the one on the left, uh, the, the, the point of, of really putting this up here is that the one on the right has got a phenomenal amount of computer power to, to whatever computer power we had in the Motorola when it first came into being. Although I think you'd be, when we talk about the phone in our pocket, I think you'd be hard pushed to put the Motorola in, in, in your pocket in those days. And I have to say the modern phones, even they have a problem and maybe that's the topic for somebody else. But the point of the matter is it brought to me the uh, quote, a what quoted quotation from Bill Gates. And it's saying here, we're always overestimating the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimating the change that will occur in the next 10. So technology has a tendency to catch us out and will actually advance much faster than perhaps we had uh, intended. So, where do we go from here? Well, from the marine perspective, I was encouraged when the House of Lords uh, uh, Science and Technology Committee uh, produced uh, this statement in its inquiry. And it was basically saying, forget about driverless cars, you know, it's just too complicated, the regulation and etc. is going to be so much, what's going to have to happen? Because obviously humans are involved a lot in, that spa in the space where the cars are going to have to go. And therefore look at sectors such as marine and agriculture. Regrettably, I have to say, as somebody from the maritime sector spending a lot of time trying to persuade government to put, invest uh, in their R&D, the government's still pouring money into the automotive sector uh, for autonomous cars 
even though the prospects of us seeing them on the roads uh, in any meaningful way are probably some years away because the public um, still does not, um, uh, does not totally trust them. So, where are we with the maritime sector? I pulled these headlines up very quickly uh, from uh, one of the um, uh, sea trade websites and what's intriguing is this, this is just a, mo a month, a month of headlines of what's going on in the, mari in the maritime sector. <coughs> Most of these you will notice are in the Far East. There are, yes, there are activities here happening in Europe as well, but the Far East are really racing ahead with a lot of these. And of course, I perhaps um, bring you to the most interesting one is the last one, because the ship that was uh, involved in that particular trial uh, was a 70,000 ton um, full-size car carrier. Some note of irony there, perhaps the car carrier was uh, <laughs> adopted for, um, you know, for a maritime test of, uh, of, of, of autonomy. But anyway, uh, we shouldn't really be surprised, therefore, that uh, maritime autonomy is really beginning to take hold in a whole host of uh, spheres. And let's look at the applications, and they're going to be talked about later, uh, later on today. And we've got a whole host of applications that are occurring now uh, for maritime or, or autonomy. And I have to say that uh, being someone who prefers to see a glass half full, rather than half empty, I was no attracted to uh, this particular quote, and I'm, I pulled it off somebody's slides, and I'm not quite sure where it originated from, but the idea that the future of sea travel is autonomous ships and leading maritime visionaries are currently working on turning this into present day reality, uh, to me, I thought was encapsulate the way certainly I feel that autonomy is going at the moment. And you may, in the panel discussion, want to disagree with me in one way or another. So, but the number of autonomous surface ships are certainly growing. Now the top row of, of, of ships there are uh, obviously small test beds, for, but they are doing real work. And I particularly draw your attention to the one uh, in the top right hand corner there on the slide. And in that particular vessel, in a, deri a derivative of that particular vessel, actually carried out a 5,000, I'll be very precise here, 5,639 kilometer unmanned survey off the coast of Alaska without incident. Now that is substantial. And uh, you know it's certainly a really good indication of the way the technology is moving, the way the technology is able to address. And then looking further ahead, you'll be familiar perhaps with the photo in the bottom right hand corner or the facsimile in the bottom right hand corner, which of course is the Yarra Birkeland. Now you, the the aim of this particular uh, uh, ship is to take 40,000 lorry journeys off the roads in, uh, in Norway. And therefore, there's a very strong environmental driver uh, to do that. And this ship and the technology, I don't know how far it's on, I'm afraid I wasn't able to find out, but I believe next, some, they were hoping for next year, but uh, we will wait and see. Probably there are other people, because Kongsberger here, they probably know uh, better than I as to uh, as to what's happening. But um, just sort of moving on uh, in this, what was very encouraging is that the government earlier this year launched Maritime 2050. Now this strategy alongside that, and some of you might have missed it, is the fact that there was also a technology route map around autonomy. And in that, it offered the prospect of support for a flagship project involving green, autonomous, coastal ships to reduce the pressure on the UK's uh, road, road system. Now, the environmental argument for such action is very strong. Now, it might be a little bit out of date to talk about the use of gas oil still in, in ships, but let's say, you know, the, the, the argument's quite compelling there when you look at it and say, you know, you can move four times uh, as much uh, by ship than you can move by, um, uh, by road for the, uh, you know, for, an, for the use of one gallon, uh, one litre, sorry, of, of fuel. And this has led uh, to 
looking at other areas of investment, and I bring you to the bottom of the slide. Now, earlier this year, um, the Flanders government came to see me together with a uh, representative of a Belgian logistics company. And their concern was, I'm going to make the first one to mention it today, was Brexit. And their concern was the congestion which might occur uh, in Dover as a result of checks and border checks that might be introduced, you know, depending on the arrangement we have for, for the future. And what this had really uh, brought them uh, to thinking about alternatives for getting their produce uh, across uh, the channel. And this was important to them because um, I seem to recall it was something like 40% of their farming and food produce from Flanders comes into the UK. So economically, they could not afford to have any delays uh, in the transportation of their goods to their main market. And as a result of that, they undertook some, had been undertaking some serious studies about how they could uh, move goods from Ostend to the southeast uh, coast of uh, the UK uh, using autonomous electric, electric hybrid ship uh, and they believed it could be financially viable, which I think is very important. And so to test the theory, uh, one of our members, Seekit, um, in fact, transported a uh, box of um, oysters uh, across in May uh, to test the technology of doing an autonomous voyage across the busy sea lanes of the Channel and the North Sea. And um, it uh, returned uh, appropriately with a case of Belgian beer. Uh, Rumour has it, that, of course, that the beer was mysteriously drunk by the time it reached the UK, but we'll, uh, we'll gloss <laughs> over that. Of course, ships are really only one part of the logistics uh, chain. And we've got to remember that the, <coughs> the port is very important in this, and the ports are actually uh, looking at this in quite a, a substantial way. Um, already we have, uh, with the Dubai ports, um, uh, Thames Gateway, uh, there the containers are uh, totally um, loaded uh, onto the lorries and picked, picked and loaded onto the lorries autonomously. Uh, it's quite interesting, the drivers have to go into sort of little, uh, a little hut, as it were, well out of the way of, the, of their truck uh, while the whole, and hold on to something to make sure that they're not, you know, they are there. Um, to make sure that the, t the, the container can be picked up, dropped onto their truck before they are allowed to get back into the cab and drive it off. But it's a very smooth, very uh, uh, clever operation. Similar, similarly, the mooring of ships. Uh, there are a number of systems now that are being introduced. I think the big challenge for the mooring, uh, autonomous mooring of ships, of course, as you as technologists here in the room will know, we'll be coming up with the standards for such uh, ships because there's, if we have multiple uh, systems, uh, it will never be adopted on a mainstream basis and therefore they've got to come up with some form of standards uh, to be able to do that. Similarly, when it comes to safety, line handling, for example, you know, tossing a line to the tug, for example, to, to bring a, a ship into, into port, highly dangerous uh, operation and Switzer are all have a major project on the go at the moment and looking into how this can be autonomously picked up and, and keeping humans out of harm's way. And um, as you might have seen in the, um, in the earlier uh, slides, uh, you've got uh, uh, Keppel and ABB uh, intending next year to have autonomous <coughs> tugs operating in the port of Singapore. So, you know, there is quite a lot, and there are quite some big drivers for the, for the ports, and that's a busy slide, uh, but in terms of uh, moving this and keeping, as I've said to you, humans out of harm's way, that is a very um, uh, important driver. But equally, there are some severe, uh, not severe, but there are some very beneficial uh, cost advantages uh, to a port in uh, demanding uh, uh, in that way. However, what are the advantages for the ship owner? So let's move on to the ship part of it now. And according to Kongsberg, uh, which bought the Rolls-Royce commercial marine business, uh, transport costs can be reduced by 22% using an unmanned vessel over a conventional manned one. 
Now bear in mind that a ship designed for autonomous operation requires no hotel services, it uh, has reduced power requirements as on, on board ship, and the resultant saving in weight is also uh, has the potential to enable it to carry more car cargo as well. And then of course there's the question of accidents and human error. Now autonomy could be an opportunity to remove the risk of human error in causing an accident. The question for us I suppose is do we trust machine learning even if intuitively I would suggest as technologists we believe in the technology. <coughs> and this brings me back to my um, an example of my car's cruise control and um, I was uh, going through these roadworks once upon a <coughs> occasion and the sun uh, was immediately behind me shining brightly on the car in front which was red had red uh, lens uh, tail lights and uh, suddenly the brakes of the car in front braked and before I could hit the pedal myself my car was already braking it had sensed that the distance between me and the car in front was reducing and it applied the brake and so who are we to say that autonomy can't achieve this in real life uh, situations with the correct sensor sensor sets etc so we we might have faith in the technology but that's not enough and we know that's not enough so back in 2014 <laughs> when we set up the UK uh, maritime autonomous systems group uh, steering group the government and industry members <laughs> recognized <coughs> that we needed to start work on persuading the uh, regulators and to use that wonderful political phrase in this period of the general election win the hearts and minds of the general public to the adoption of maritime autonomy so industry was keen to be a seen to be a responsible industry a busy slide uh, but uh, all of these issues were being looked at back. and what we did look, looked, looked at and what we did we then formed um, a regulatory working group from the steering group and I asked the indefatigable James Fanshawe who many of you probably know who has helped with actually the preparation of some of these slides to take up the chair of that uh, regulatory working group uh, participation in the group uh, has grown rapidly with inputs from the MCA the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency uh, Royal Navy, Departments for Business and Transport, and we have lawyers, insurers, and classification societies alongside the nascent MAS industry when we set it up back in 2014-2015. Uh, 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 One of the first actions was to produce a code of conduct uh, to which industry signed up, and at the same time substantive work was commenced on producing a code of practice for the design, build, operation and training requirements for MAS surface ships and at that time the ambition was to deal with ships up to 24 meters in length. So where are we at now? On Friday, just gone, uh, the third iteration of the uh, Code of Practice was published. This time we incorporated an updated Code of Conduct in the, uh, the document and this is now available for download. It's a very comprehensive document. And the UK has very much taken the lead in codifying uh, the design and operation of MAS. And we know many jurisdictions have looked at these publications for informing uh, their own local regulatory regimes for MAS, rather MAS, MAS being the extra S for uh, surface ships, um, uh, for MAS op operations. Equally, um, the classification societies have risen <coughs> to the challenge and uh, have responded with a series of guidelines on autonomy for shipping. So, where are we with regulation? Again, you can read these at leisure when the IMRS uh, uh, put, them, put these slides out. But I'll just highlight the two, one in, the two bullets in bold. 
Safety and trust are very important, no matter how competent the technology may be. <coughs> Early in uh, 2016, uh, my organisation, SMI, uh, commissioned an exercise on behalf of the regulatory working group and part funded by the business department to scope the IMO regulatory regime <coughs> and identify those instruments uh, under Solus and Marple which had relevance to, auto, as we saw it, to autonomous operations. And there are a lot, as you will see from this, uh, from this slide. It is but therefore perhaps no surprise that, uh, that this report uh, was asked for by the IMO Working Group, um, which was set up and tasked with reviewing the current regulations and uh, looking at the equivalence exercise, as we called it, uh, in terms of uh, how uh, the IMO should address the, the situation of autonomous ocean-going vessels uh, in the future. And uh, it's hoped that this will report to the MSC uh, substantially next year. And this will start the whole process of IMO regulation for the future operation of ocean-going vessels. And you can be sure that uh, there'll be many discussions, uh, strong discussions, occurring in that august body. But that should be said that I think those of you that have had experience of the IMO, this has moved by IMO standards relatively quickly. Uh, and it's rather encouraging that it has done. And I do put a lot of that down to the current Secretary General, who, as you can see with, uh, you know, we've, it's been mentioned today about the, uh, the uh, ambition for the greenhouse gas emissions, for example, very strong lead from the IMO, whereas as we know with previous attempts uh, with uh, uh, various controls of um, uh, whether it's ballast water or the, or the uh, sulphur etc, there's been a little bit of dragging feet as it were, but there is certain real pace now is beginning to appear uh, in that, uh, that body and uh, everything else that's going on we've already heard about this morning uh, are really going to help to feed into, into that piece. From the UK's perspective, I mentioned uh, Maritime 2050. Uh, the UK government has empowered its regulatory body, I'm pleased to say the MCA, uh, to support the development of mass regulations and there's now a, a team, a substantial team within the uh, MCA that is focusing on, on that, both in terms of local and, uh, and, um, and, and of course in support of the IMO. Um, I think it's by taking this sort of mature, informed <coughs> approach, we can ensure that the regulation is fit for purpose and responding to the rapid <coughs> ad, uh, adoption of autonomous systems. And I'm pleased to say that the P&I clubs, um, which is quite significant that the P&I clubs are for the ship owners, are already looking at how they can provide insurance for the ship owner that wants to look at autonomizing in whatever form their vessel. I've glossed over there very quickly the human element, just bringing things into um, uh, before I, I, I move on to, to conclusion. And um, it has to be said that this hasn't been forgotten, certainly in terms of the code of practice. And I know that uh, IMRS, uh, I don't want to sort of strain the area of IMRS, but IMRS are uh, doing, doing an awful lot of work and looking at, uh, at this. And the, the, the main message being, of course, that the um, that we will still need people, even with autonomy. The difference is that the skill sets are going to be different to those of the traditional mariner. And that therefore, this, um, uh, I think the work that IMRS is doing in this area is going to be very, very important in ensuring that we not only have, you know, institutions providing the, sk the, sk the skill education, but also we have a way of measuring and ensuring that people are properly validated and certi certificated uh, to be able to support the industry in the way that it needs to do. So, as I draw to a close, it should be clear that maritime autonomy in one form or another is with us now and the industry is taking a responsible approach into how it's being adopted. The business case is evolving and the prospect of offering ship owners substantial operational uh, savings is being made. So, whoops, I got that, yeah. I 
put the question out, evolution, evolution or revolution, well, it will depend on the pace of change. So can artificial intelligence really replace the human on the bridge? Now, back in September, Google revealed its quantum computer, which performed a target computation in 200 seconds, which it is claimed would have taken 10,000 years by the world's most powerful supercomputer. So, this takes me back to Bill Gates. <coughs> Can we really say that computers and machine learning will not advance at such a pace in the next decade that artificial, artificial intelligence will become the norm and able to assimilate an infinite number of scenarios in the time the human eye has transmitted what it sees to the brain? My closing slide is very much on, uh, I think, an appropriate quotation from Colin Powell, and James Fanshawe, I think, has put it quite neatly. So thank you very much indeed for listening.